Hello, Lightning Tamers. Welcome to the Taming Lightning live stream. We're going to go and do a Q&A, a live Q&A for uh, the Plasma Sculpture Using Glass Solder class with Ed Kirshner. I also have as a moderator here with us Sean from Research Lab. Say hello to our audience, Ed and Sean. Hello. Hello, everybody. So we're going to take in questions as we go. Uh, Sean will be looking at the Instagram, but it's easier for you guys to see if you jump onto YouTube. So you're going to see only a portion of the screen on your on on uh, Instagram right now. I don't have any ways to rotate it, I believe. I'm just trying to get your to jump onto YouTube because everyone has YouTube. So make sure you join us here on YouTube. Give me a second, I might be able to transform that call. Nope, I don't have access to rotate that, so tough luck. Um, so uh, the point of the Q&A is to be able to get a sense of what the class is about, answer a few questions, and to be able to um, give, some, uh, give you guys a better sense of what's going on for the class. So there's a few things that probably get messed up in creating a, uh, a description for the class. Um, and we'll kind of start with the dates, um, the uh, slots left for the class, and we'll try to get into that soon here. So you guys are probably seeing the post on the website, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Instagram. Uh, so this class is taking part at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Um, it's from July 18th to the 22nd, so that's uh, technically five days, but really it's four and a half days. Um, you do you have class time from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. with a voluntary time in the evening this uh, from 6 p.m. to 10 which is not very common amongst all these different other institutions that provide classes sometimes it is either paid or they leave that so people can rent uh, so you only get the 9 to 5 again it's voluntary but in this process it's very involved and so we will want to uh, try to maximize as much of our time as possible whether that's filling extra discussions or whatnot. Just a lot to go over. Um, so the tuition price 800 has gone up to 850. That changed after February 28th. I think after March 1st, maybe March 15th, I can't quite remember, it'll go to the full price of $900. So if you're trying to get in this class, uh, make sure you jump on it right now while it's 850. Uh, also note, we only have one slot left. This class is an eight person total class. So there are seven spots filled, one spot remaining. So if you want this class, jump in and get it. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about the class, Ed. Uh, can, basically what our ex expectations are for this class for using glass solder. Sure. Uh, the, the basic idea is how do you uh, take pre-made uh, glass pieces and assemble them together so that you get a vessel that you can uh, have the gases in and then have a plasma in that. Um, it's generally with, uh, with, for this particular class, I find that the solder uh, works best with studio blown glass. So pieces that they can be, you know, production pieces, but basically with studio blown glass would be best. Uh, manufactured glass, uh, okay, but much more difficult and uh, uh, more failure rates because there's a the the manuf most of the manufactured glass is somewhat harder, and uh, it's the, the 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 matching of the electrodes, the the uh, neon electrodes that we have to use, and other aspects. Um, it's better to use the studio glass. So that's been my experience. Yeah. Um, you, there'll be a studio glass pieces available um, at the, the glass center. You might bring your own studio glass pieces, um, or sometimes you can get studio glass pieces from other other sources. Mm -hmm. uh, that that would be fine. 
Uh, I prefer not to, again, use bottles and others, even though we can do that. Okay. Yeah, in, in this class, this class is primarily going to be focused in the kiln shop at the Pisser Glass Center. The kiln shop is a space that you will use for uh, having mold, mold glass, slump glass, fuse glass, cast glass. Um, and then we may also we will also be using the cold shop in order to prepare these pieces of glass to uh, adhere the solder and the electrode. Um, so this class is this solder is not like someone thinks about when it comes to jewelry. This solder is a kiln fired enamel that joins the two pieces of glass together, and that's why Ed brought up the point that you want to make sure that your glass is as close and as possible to the glass that is used in the electrode. So studio glass, as you mentioned, uh, we've used a lot of different glasses over, this, over the years. We've used when we had Crystallica here earlier. We've used glass when we were out in Sweden. Uh, the studio glass used for glass blowing is typically uh, quite compatible. Um, but there, there are some definite tricks you have to work through in order to set this up, and it uh, can be a bit finicky, right? Yeah. And the, the other thing that if you get you get into it, sometimes you can um, have, oh, how do, how do I put this? You can design a piece that doesn't really need an electrode or doesn't need an inside electrode. And you can do plugs and things like that. If you have a second piece of glass from the same glass, mm -hmm. the important thing is to match the glasses. Right. So, if you don't use an electrode, then it's okay to use hard glass because the solder works fine for that. Mm. Harder glass, not not borosilicate. Right, right. Just, <laughs> <laughs> that's a totally different thing. And by the way, there is a solder I developed for borosilicate. That's in the side, but uh, we're we're working on basically the soda line glass. And uh, then you just as, as long as you're doing two pieces of glass that are this. The same is the best. In other words, if you have you have two bowls that you want to put together, they should be the basically the same two bowls uh, out of the same glass. Mm -hmm. In this case, the image are the store bought the those ubiquitous uh, uh, cobalt the blue uh, coffee cups. Now that is a hard glass, but hard glass to hard glass is fine. Putting soldering those together. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with a little effort, we can get an electrode, but the failure rate is somewhat higher. We generally use a, um, a transition glass mm. uh, between the electrode and the harder glass uh, with no guarantee. Mm. So, but they'll also find other glass forms. Uh, for example, I've used carafes that have a large bottom mm -hmm. uh, insert. And in a case like that, you don't. You can use. You can have an external or a capacitive electrode situation, and then you don't need an electrode, so you can work with that. And then you just have to be a little. It's a little tricky to put the tubulation on, but it's uh, easier to get away with a tubulation uh, than uh, an electrode when when there's a somewhat incompatibility. Right. Um so when it comes to when it comes to um, your use of solder, um, how'd that begin? Uh, what was the reason for you to start using solder in, in, at all? Uh, when I uh, went back to uh, into to glass, I re I wanted to do plasma, and I wanted to get back into doing. Uh, well, first I wanted to get back into doing art after being out of it for. 30 some odd years and you know the bug got me again and i always liked glass i always liked light etc and electronics so i thought i would get back into it and uh i was about 55 and i when i went to the glass school so i knew i had to work with glass to do my vessels to make for, pl for plasma i i realized that with the the kids in the class, there are sort of two, two, two groups. One was people that seem to be born with the knack to do the glass blind, and people who are going to really work hard on it and sweat for the next 20 years to really become really, really good. Uh, 
I wasn't born with it and I didn't have 20 years to go. So I had a choice, either, either have other people blow my pieces or find a way to put pieces together myself. And it was a, seemed to be a, a more convenient and cheaper way to just figure out how to put glass forms together for the plasma. And, you know, thinking about it and, and all the rest, I thought that the only way to do that would be something similar to a glue. But I realized that glues were no good for plasma because they outgassed and they threw in the plasma. So got uh, I had to develop a way to put the glass together that itself was inert and that would be something like a, you know, would be like another glass. So a glass solder idea was how this solder work. It's you have two pieces of metal you want to put together and you have another uh, metal uh, that is that melts at a lower temperature. So basically that was the approach. I thought, how the, how do I work that out? And found out people had been doing it for in the in, in electronics previously. Uh, but the what they used was very, very expensive. But at least I had the idea it could work. So I decided to figure out how to make my own that wasn't so costly. Mm -hmm. And I came up with the idea of uh, uh, glass enamel since I realized that, you know, people were putting enamels onto glass and that that was itself a glass and uh, maybe that could be used as a solder. And lo and behold, uh, after a hundred experiments, it really worked. So I did that. And I basically used just a broche, um low fire uh, glass enamel flux um, as the base, uh, as the base for the the, the solder. There, there are other refinements to it, also the type of alcohol you use, and some other. Uh, small additives. Mm. The one, this particular one that Percy is showing is a harder glass, and in this particular case, um, if the top that's not a you know, the top is plugged now to forget the cork part, but the top is plugged with a glass plug, but that glass plug is cut out of another bottle. Mm, just like this one smart. So, so it's the same glass so the solder works fine with that the solder has a big range uh, i would say from oh 85 to 115 probably that that whole range that we would be working with is fine the important thing is that the two pieces of glass match as close as possible so the top was was relatively easy to do. The bottom was I had to put an electrode in, and you notice how thick that is. Yeah, Even if thick. it was the same glass, thickness to thinness is also difficult. Sometimes color is difficult. Like mm. um, even if two glasses are the same thickness and the same glass, if one's let's say cobalt blue and the other's clear, you could have an incompatibility. Yeah. So. So you have to be careful with that. In this case, what I did was I um, countersunk. I drilled down to make the glass thin at the joint part. As you can sort of see it a bit. There's a cone. And so at the point the electrode touches up, it, it's very, there's a very thin connection there. And after many uh, tries, I got the uh, solder to... Uh, to hold. Okay. Looks like you might have a question here. I'm, I'm waiting for Mark Title to get into the chat here. With sure. Us. Um, Sean, are you able to help him get into the chat? I sent a link in there just a moment ago while Ed was uh, kind of explaining that. Um, but it looks like he was waiting for Ed's overview first. But Yeah, I so, think he was in the same chat room as I was in, and uh, he's yeah, got to get that link. I dropped it in there. Maybe, I think Instagram is, I mean, uh, the YouTube's keep me from doing that. Um, uh, tell him, let me, let me tell him. 
to search. Yeah, t can, you, can you take care of that and tell him to search properly uh, to get to that? YouTube keeps sending a completely new link whenever I want to start a new, uh, start a live stream, even if I'm using the same template. So make sure you get him to do that. Um, so uh, his question is um, just about the kiln fired enamel. Do you mix it yeah. with something to make it a paste? And how do you keep yeah. the glass vessel from slumping at kiln temperature? The, the solda is at a melts at a lower temperature than the annealing temperature of the uh, glass. Mm. So it it's particular it's made explicitly so that the glass will not slump. That was the whole idea of developing the solder. The same way you might have a silver solder, the solder itself melts, puts the two pieces of silver together, but the silver itself doesn't deform mm -hmm. or it doesn't melt itself. Right. And the the temperature I work at is just below the annealing temperature of most studio glass. So I'll work at about 925, let's say. Mm -hmm. And yeah. most studio glass would be like 945, 950. Yeah. Um, and I do it. And even though the Sada, the, the Roche enamel uh, has a, the, a stated melting point of a uh, 1050 you can trade you can trade time for temperature within a range so by leaving it in for a very long time i don't have to take the solder up to uh to melt it i don't have to go to uh, 1050 i can i can do it below 950. Uh, now sometimes there's little differences with the different pieces of glass and with different types of studio glass etc uh so there you know it's it's it's, it's an alchemy to it uh after a while you get to understand that there's not a big pro you know how to do it without a problem uh you have much less of a problem with this with the manufactured glass on slumping that's a trade-off it's tougher to put the electrodes on but you almost never have a slumping problem with the manufactured glass. It's harder and it has seems to have a higher annealing point. So so the the soldering is done at a, a, a significantly below the annealing point. The 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 uh, firing range I use basically would be look very much like an annealing range with at, with the top being somewhat below the annealing temperature. But it follows the same pattern. Uh, you, when you're coming down, for example, you come down very slowly uh, from the, the top, and then you can drop a little bit faster. Okay. Uh, another question that he'd asked, um, let's see what he got here. Uh, the process, so the process allows the attaching electrodes to the piece, right? Do the electrodes yes. survive the kiln temperature? Of course, yes, the electrodes do survive the kiln temperature. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you have to be sometimes uh sometimes to be safe i wrap the electrode and the, particularly the tubulation in the kiln paper yeah uh, just just so it doesn't slump yeah, so it the electrode it's the let the electrodes are generally i don't know if they change them but they're they're lead glass and they have a lower annealing temperature so you got to be a little more careful with the electrodes themselves and they're thin so yeah. Ed, I, I have a question for you about your uh, glass solder. Have you have yeah. you ever tried to pigment the glass solder and change maybe the color of the glass solder to yes. match maybe like all black if you have uh, like no, I've done, uh, I, I did a little of that and I actually I I, I like cobalt blue for whatever reason, so I've done it with uh, with co with so I've done it where I wanted the joints actually to have a color like a cobalt blue color. I will put a little bit of the Roche uh, cobalt blue low fire. Uh, it, it generally, the the transparent one. Yeah, you can do that. Great, thank you. I I, I have not done the black. I'm always a little leery, leery of that because that because of the temperature uh, differential. I'm a little leery of that much, but probably just fine. Probably fine. Great, thank you. Good question. Yeah. Um, another, just an aside, is 
there are all things that come up, but you know, strange things that will come up. Like if you get a manufactured piece and you love the color, in many cases, that color will not be in the glass. It will actually be a coating. Mm. And it is really, really bad if you happen to not know it's a coating and you try to do this in the kiln. It oh, really yeah. stinks. It burns off and it uh, pollutes the whole place. So it's always good to pre-check mm -hmm. if, it's, if, it's if it's color glass, yeah. whether it is a, you know, a, a coating. Yeah. Uh, it can be a glass coating, it's fine. You know what I mean. If yeah, it's, it's, it's a it, kind of plastic it, or synthetic. It's a, pl a synthetic plas a plastic type coating. Yeah. yeah, I've seen that happen a lot of times when people are trying to like take uh, wine bottles or, or alcohol bottles and they try to make cups out of them and it just like just turns yep. black and starts smoking in the, the whole uh, smoking up the whole place. It's pretty, exactly. <laughs> it's yes, pretty it's pretty bottle. miserable. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The other is a weird one, which that bottle that uh, Percy had up there, the uh, that was a, a, a whiskey bottle. And that is a weird thing that many manufactured glass took me a while to figure this one out. A long time. The bottle, the glass becomes conductive after it's been fired a few times. Huh. And I could not figure out what the, I could not understand that. So you don't want to do a plasma piece where the glass is conductive, mm. or you know, you go near it, you get yourself a shock. Yeah. So the glass, in effect, turned to metal, even though it didn't look any different. Wow! And it, and uh, when we were, remember when we were in Sweden, there was that that guy from I think Finland, that really glass expert, who yeah. made that that bio glass, etc. Yeah. He said, he says, well, I think what's happening is you know that ma most manufactured glasses are coated. They put special coats on the on it for various reasons to keep it from scratching when shipping and all of that. And he said, I think if you fire it, you may be oxidizing it. And if you oxidize it, even though you don't see it, the ox it becomes conductive. Mm. And I tested it when I got back from Sweden, and lo and behold. He was right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I've had weird moments where um, colors like green, I have green frit on the outside, and the chromium yeah. adds a bit of capacitance to it, so you get more of a shock if you try to touch a, a piece that has the chromium on the outside, the chromium that, green. Yeah, it's not just on the outside. If you put back that one, the one you had before, the two vases of the green, Don't touch the piece. <laughs> I, wow. For whatever reason, green, green, that green glass is conductive. <laughs> I mean, not as bad as that bottle got after we fired it. Yeah, time. but yeah, you, 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 you can get a zap out of a uh, out of the green glass. Yeah. But thanks for telling. I hadn't realized it was the chromium in it. I just knew. Oops, got to be careful of this green glass. Yeah. Uh, so I'm stepping back here. The skill level, we, I, I yeah. feel like maybe I mislabeled this, even though I have a descriptor. The skill level is intermediate, but I think what we should say there is that the difficulty level is in intermediate. Um, that the class itself lends itself to being uh, anyone could can learn this. Um, yeah. As I, as I said, the, that was one of the reasons I developed the glass sauna. It was for me when I was just starting out and I realized I couldn't blow pieces that I needed. And, you know, at my lower skill level, I would be able to put something together. So, yeah, uh, if it's a, a beginner can actually do this as long as they don't try to do something elaborate. And my experience in doing classes is almost inevitably people who are starting out try to do something elaborate and then they get frustrated because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're just starting out, yes, you can do this, but you need to do things that are simple. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, to do it. Uh, it's good if people have other experience. Obviously, if you have glass experience, it's great. Uh, neon experience is good for the, you know, to understand a little more of the plasma and the electronics, but that's not necessary. Okay. Uh, I mentioned that it's good often for scientists or engineers who sort of want to get their hands dirty to go in to do this because they have a sense of some of the things some of the technical things also well beyond me uh, as to how to, you know, how the plasma works, how the electronics works, how other aspects of the, uh, of, of putting the piece together might work. Yeah. But they don't have to either have uh, a glass, uh, glass background. Got it. Uh, so I'm, since there's three of us in this meeting, it is give me a countdown. So I'm gonna go hit pause on our, our screen here and we're going to jump in and out of zoom to kind of refresh our our um our, our uh, zoom time okay so i'm going to put everyone okay. on pause. i'm going to pause the screen for the stream uh, sounds good our gentleman mark title gets in here um i'm going to pause
night, and we are back. This is awesome. All right, I'm not kidding. Hello, hello. Hello. All right, Ed. I'm here. Excellent. <laughs> So last thing we touched on was kind of the like skill level and the kind of, I think that's one of the things that we always try to figure out that when we try to, at different institutions, how to determine skill level, difficult level, and how to make that as, as simple as possible. Because it, it can be difficult determining your own efficiency in this process, um, whether you're glass or whatever. Um, but I hope we kind of help clear that up quite a bit here. Um, that this is a class that is, uh, for anyone interested in using glass and plasma, but does require to do, continue to learn skills and manipulating, whether that's cold working, uh, fitting, and, and mixing in this process. But it is, the difficulty level is intermediate because it can be uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty difficult to, to complete successfully. Lots and lots of practice, lots and lots of glass, right, Ed? <laughs> Yes, lots and lots of failures. Lots That's of one yes. <laughs> one to warn people. I should say, when I first started out on this, and I was using um, store-bought glass in, in bottles, I had a 90% failure rate. Mm. So it took a while to get that up to 50%. But I, I, you know, again, once again, studio-blown glass, much lower failure rate. Mm. Yeah. So I think I have a couple other in images down here. If you want to take a look at some specific pieces on your website, you let me know. Um, again, you got to register now for the summer intensive for this class once a spot is remaining at this time as of this release, as of this live stream. Um, so I have work here from Jason Chakravarty. He was one of your students uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah, very, those, are, those are fun pieces. And... I like the idea, I haven't done it myself, but I like the idea of putting glass within a, a, a form like that. Mm -hmm. um, I believe he is glass soldering the, uh, the, the, the jaws all, uh, onto the base. That is, that is correct. He, he notes that in yeah. his, uh, his description of these pieces yeah. here. And then he doesn't have, I'm not sure, one has an electro, yeah, they both have electrodes. Yeah. Um, it's possible uh, that you can do it without an electrode by just having electrification under it, but you'd still need to have a uh, tubulation to pump the the air out and put the uh, the gas in. Mm -hmm. Another alternate, another way, and uh, Wayne Stratman has done this, and I think. Oh, and uh, Larry Albright, and that is you, the pieces, you, the things you put in, the little sculptures are also metallic, they're metal. Oh. And they can, oh, and you've done that too, Percy. A little bit of that, yeah. Yeah, and, and they then can act, uh, depending how you do it, as, as, as the electrode on the inside, or they can be played with the plasma as it goes through them. So that's another alternative. Nice. Uh, so I did include some pictures from the residency I did at Toledo um, where I was playing around with pulling the shell out of it. I haven't filled these pieces yet um, because in this case, I had to deal with taking, instead of having a flat surface to go into, I had it sort of a rounded surface. And it made yeah. it much more difficult to accurately chamfer and, and, and dent that because I w had to work with the thin or thick areas of that. Um, ah. I have finished um, soldering them as of uh, last week, uh, so I'm hoping to start maybe um, fill one of the pieces next week or in the next coming weeks to see the difference between not having the shell in there and the next video where the shell is sitting in the center there. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. So the previous image just doesn't have the shell. Oh, here's another important thing. In case you do it the first time, and remember, it's if you work with, with neon, you know, you have that Tesla coil to check for leaks. Mm -hmm. we, are, we have to, whenever you do this, we do the same. Mm -hmm, yes. uh, use that. And if it leaks, 
but that doesn't mean that you just then resolder it. Yeah, you don't take it apart. Exactly. You just put more solder around and and rekiln it, and and usually you can get that to work. You know, to two or three in in two or three shots, even even when it's not a a, a really good fit. But it's yeah. best to get a good fit. But you know, you can you can play with it back and forth. Uh, yeah, like. I, I put pieces in five times to make them work. You know, that's, so. that's what ended up happening for me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, as long as you have a nice structure that can have it done, you can continue to kind of build it up. So, yeah. Uh, best practice is you don't have to do that. Is that you wouldn't best have practice to do that. Is you don't have to do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, what studio glass was that? Uh, they had Crystallica. They had Crystallica. And what, What's the expansion on that one? It's, what, like, it's like close 97? To, yeah, it's close to 96. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, if we're using electrodes, the higher the expansion, the better up for the glass. Yeah. Yeah, and so, like, uh, you've seen this work, the Inspire Cherry piece. So what, uh, what you mentioned when we taught the class back in 2019 was the idea of cutting down the electrodes. Um, yeah. So you just have the shell sitting in there, and that's been like a really fun thing for me to play around with, because I no longer have this three inch protrusion. I can leave exactly. it into a single inch or three quarter inch protrusion off the side, so it's not so much of an eyesore, and it's less chance of breaking that off. Um, and it also is easier to solder. Yes, because it holds itself in place. Exactly. That's the other thing you'll find. One of the it's the gymnastics of putting these pieces in the kill that that's really fun and part of the art of it. Um, everything has to be just right and braced because remember when the solder melts, it's liquid and things slide unless yeah. they're braced. So, so always, always good to be, and, yeah, but this one of dropping the 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 shell in holds 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 it, holds it in place. Holds it in place. Mm. Mm. So this is kind of just illustrating, so kind of illustrating adding in the uh, yeah. the, uh, the solder here. The solder here. Okay, uh, you'll find. And by the way, it's strangely do. Relative to the kiln you use, something I haven't talked about much. Different kilns do the solder differently for a reason I do not understand. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a very um, sort of white solder, right? Yeah. Most most often it'll be more gray, and sometimes a little depending. And if you're really lucky and it's thin, it'll be sort of clear, translucent. But in a some kilns, it comes out, it, it must reduce because it comes out black. Mm. And you have to, so sometimes you have to have to check your kiln. Um, most of the large studio kilns are fine. Mm. And then it's just a range of gray to white, to translucent. But, you know, when I first started this, I had one small kiln and one big kiln. And everything I did in the small kiln, it decided it worked, but it came out black for whatever reason. It, it reduced. <laughs> yeah. We got a question from Mundy Hepburn in the chat that says, uh, hey, does, yeah. does your solder crystallize? Does the solder crystallize? No. In other words, if it's heat, you mean what, what's, does it, good question. I'm, I'm trying to think. I'd have to think back all of the times I've done it. Has it ever crystallized? No, no. Can it crystallize? I assume it could, but but uh, I, I it doesn't crystallize. No. Sometimes it beads up. That's a totally different thing. And and it doesn't flow, and that's that's a bad joint. But uh, it's it tend yeah. I I I haven't had it sort of crystallize. I've had it when there's an incompatibility. I've had the solder get hairline cracks but again i can't recall it actually crystallized what causes it to bead rather than flow i don't know and some it it's i i 
how do I say it? I, I, there's nothing consistent about whether it, it's going to be or, or not. Uh, there is a way, yeah, if you're at, generally if you're at too low a temperature for too short a period of time, it will tend to be. But I've had cases where if I've left it in too long, it'll flow, and then if you leave it in longer, it starts beating. I, it, hmm. it, it, has a mind, <laughs> it has a mind of its own. And it's, again, it's, it's alchemy. So these other images are just me illustrating. Now, importantly, assembly. importantly yes? the whole question of beading and all of these others, that's only the solder when you have it, the, the gopping solder on the outside. That's the trick to make the best joint is to have very tight fitting lapping with a solder is lapped between two pieces of closely fit glass then you don't have any then, then you have any problem with it beating or crystallizing or any to it just huh. it just fuses uh that's you're basically cold work solder yeah the, the cold work is very important yeah yeah hmm. the, shall we go which, which ones of these you want me to talk about which is soldered and which aren't or what yeah which one would you like to uh, to speak on here oh well what the heck let's do the let's do the cherry the cherry the cherry the cherry that's a whoops that's done with uh mitch lafont and it's a it's about oh almost three feet with the stem so it's it's blown it's studio blown in three pieces the the stem the internal pit and the the body and it is then assembled hot with the the stem then you know in effect you punty it into the the, the body oh, and wow. the say and then the the pit is done similarly but they the pit is hollow and there's an opening from the pit so that into the pit then goes the uh, bronze wall, which acts as an effect, a capacitive electro. Mm. And that's what gets, uh, that's what, that's what gets electrified. Now the end of the stem is a, is plug and there's just a, a, a glass plug to, to close off the stem at the end. Okay. No electro. No electro. Wow. And the, the mix in this case is, is primarily, I'd say about six, I mean, about 200 tour or thereabouts with a trace of, uh, of air, maybe, maybe five tour of, of air. And you use the air to tune the plasma. We will be getting into the plasma, uh, tuning, etc. in the class too. That, that's mm -hmm. obviously part of the class. The next one over is also the uh, the jalapeno is uh, also by Mitch. That's over three feet, and that is done in two pieces: the body and then the stem. And in this case, um, this is really a tricky one. We tried uh, uh, tried to hot shop hot hot the stem to get into the body of it and it didn't quite match so after i had to fill it with solder it was it was attached but it was still had air space mm. and i i heated it several times you know soldered it several times then at the end of that stem there is an electron okay and that was that was soldered in to the uh the end of the stem yeah and the gas on that, I think, is that's a that's a that's a uh, xenon neon mix for that. Oh. One. I would say probably seventy-five to it. The one in the middle, the tall one, the the vases, that's about. Those are store bought. That's from Crate and Barrels, my favorite place. Get a lot of stuff there. <laughs> There's a six, six glass uh, vases. 
it's about four feet high, and those are glass soldered together. They're done in a lifting kiln that I uh, built. Well, actually, David David Ruth built. We sort of did the, he did most of the, almost all of the work, but it was mm -hmm. for his higher pieces and for me to be able to do tall pieces. And so that is done with you know you between the vases you'd have to drill cold work the, the bottoms out of the vases you lap the, the lips together um, and then you put it in upside down and put the electrode in the top in the you know in sitting on the top mm -hmm. and that's that's last solid the whole thing yeah that's an important and thing to notice is that um, whenever you're doing your glass solder you can only line yourself up with gravity you can't stick something oh, solder yes. perpendicular to the object because gravity is going to make it fall away from that. So it, yes, yeah, you have to be perpendicular. And again, with like this, it had to be totally braced the whole thing because the joints could slip. So putting that thing all stacked together in a lifting kiln, uh, four feet high, was was quite fun. I'd almost recommend coating it all in plaster and then <laughs> taking it all apart uh, so it can't move. Uh, uh, actually, it would be the plaster would get into the joint. You, didn't want, you wouldn't want that. I don't think. You get to do sort of a, a, a contortion. You have to become a bit of a contortionist to do it. So. And, and the, the solder itself will run whatever direction gravity is going. So even if you have it on an axis, it probably will just drip off. Um, it will it will drip down, yes, but it, yeah. it's very viscous. So in some cases, I have actually put electrodes in uh, perpendicular. And uh, you, you can do that. You have to do another little gymnastics on it, but it does just what you said. And so you, you compensate. You put more solder on the of the paste on the top of the and let it flow down around the uh, the electrode. Yeah, uh, I, I do not recommend doing. <laughs> on the right one there, the uh, hang the the uh, uh, and it's a neatomid eternal light was done for a synagogue near here. Uh, that is a blown piece by uh, Pamina Taylor, Tyler uh, based on a design I, I had and something she had been making separate also. And all the, the, the solder part is putting the electrode in the top. There's a cap that is actually made, was also blown from the studio glass and then huh. the the electrodes into the cap and the cap is then glass soldered into the top of the piece and then you have little handles and it hangs on uh on the chain and that is a that's uh let me see yeah that this one is a xenon with the touch of uh of um, iodine. Okay. I like the softness of the sandblasted glass. And the saw, so yes, it, it, it's a nice effect, but, but it's it, like this, you know. Again, the pattern is tunable, so you you can turn it up or down and to, to make the pattern move more quicker or, 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 or slower or just have the piece flow. Mm. Uh, I love it when it's very active, but the rabbi wouldn't let me do it because it distracted when he gave his sermon. <laughs> I kid you not. So That's I have wild. to turn it down. <laughs> uh, let's see if there's any other sort of... Uh, the one you write in the middle one, well, that's... You can't see it much, but the... Uh, this one here? Yeah, that one there. Let's just see lazy. that. Let's just see it. That's I, I do a lot of these little apothecaries. Now that is that is lead glass. That's crystal. It does and have this blue shimmer to it a bit. Yeah, that's part. It, 
crystal glass will will tend to glow slightly blue for whatever reason and for some weird reason as an aside some borosilicate will do the same mm -hmm. and i have no idea and the same batch some will i've had tubes you know borosilicate same batch some will glow blue and some won't who knows mm. uh but crystal always bl glows that blue so the top is glass soldered in and then the electrode is glass soldered on the bottom now that is done upside down but sometimes i'll do it twice to make it easy i'll just i'll solder the, the top on first okay then i'll put it in again upside down put the electrode on but brace it so you don't have to worry about the top moving off. Okay. And that, yeah. And now the electrode, the, the neon electrode to, to, to crystal is very easy. I mean, they match. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a lead glass. You just have to be careful that you can't go up quite as high with the sun. Yeah. <laughs> There's a trade off there. That, this one can slump. And at a certain point, the solder is not going to flow so to compensate for that as an aside i developed a separate solder that that melts at 800 instead of 925 and it's a very 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 high uh, lead content solder uh, that was actually i got it i got it from a leftover from some some uh, NASA, old NASA uh, uh, solder they used it for for stainless steel to glass. I have no huh. idea what. And it was it was big chunks of this stuff. So I had to grind it myself, and I was told that that was crazy because this is eighty four percent lead. So <laughs> don't breathe it. <laughs> Meaning. The, the, the glass solder itself is 24% lead and the, 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 the Roche, roughly. And the uh, crystal glass is, is in that lower range also. But this particular glass solder that I use, the, the special low fire one is very high in, uh, in, in, in lead content. Nice. Okay, any, any other ones? Now, there's no glass solder involved in the one on the right. That's borosilicate uh, disc, about a one foot disc diameter uh, done on a, on a glass lathe. Five, it's a three, let's see, there's nine millimeter glass. And so it had to be done with, um, with uh, oxygen hydrogen torch. Mm. A lot of heat. Probably a pretty expensive too. Well, uh, what was that? And it's probably also very expensive too. Uh, yeah, so I always look for a little cheaper way to do it. And I now have I'm testing on doing the same thing but not but not doing it on the glass lathe. And actually that's why I'm I'm using a I'm putting the two top plate, the top and bottom plate on using the borosilicate glass solder. Okay. That saves a fortune. It won't be as pretty, but it saves for the glass form, but it mm. saves a fortune. Yeah. So all I do is I have two discs that are nine millimeter discs of, of borosilicate glass, and I cut out a, you know, a, a cylinder of nine millimeter borosilicate from a big tube, a, a one foot tube. And then just glass solder them together and cross my fingers <laughs> because there's an awful lot of pressure when you have flat it's very very <laughs> iffy <Yeah. laughs> I, I definitely had pieces implode so. we'll save that for the halloween special things that go boom yeah, in the night right. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> oh <laughs> let's see these are all really wonderful, Ed. These well, that thanks. was just amazing. Like the 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 just the visuals on these are just incredible. 
Oh, thank you. If you keep going up, let's see if there's any others I should point out. Oh, I like the one on the right. That the um, that one's a three foot. You don't see it up up a little bit. Uh, this one here, the the engine. No, or? no, the the uh, the the one that the what the, the sperm shaped one. Oh, the orange with the stripes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is this is Jaime uh, Guerrero. He threw this away, and uh, I saw it in his pile. He didn't like it, and I said, "Hey, Jaime, I bet you I could make this into a piece." <laughs> I said, "Okay, why not?" So that's what I did. I took the thing and I, I torched the open end, you know, the tip part. Mm -hmm. I just torched it closed. This is, you know, studio glass. And then I uh, put an electrode on the bottom and presto, we got a piece. <laughs> is that still within your uh, collection one, somewhere? Uh, this one's in the collection down in LA. Oh. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, that's the bottles. Now, here are the bottles. You know, the, when I, the one on the right was one of the first ones I did with these, the sherry bottles. I, I love, I love sherry. So I drank a lot of sherry. Then I have the bottles. It's a, it's, I, I love those blue bottles. Harvey's, Harvey's Bristol Cream. That's when I started out. And I'm telling you, when I first did this, 90% didn't work. It took me the longest time to get a full set of eight bottles mm. that worked. <laughs> and they have an electrode soldered into the top, basically. But I did a um, transition glass for that. They, yeah, and they don't have an electrode at the bottom, but they're on a grounding plate. To help draw it down. So you have a the, the hot comes in like the spark plug wire and then it, the whole the whole body this is a, a v8 engine block is and the plates are grounded and so it pulls the plasma down from the uh the electrode and that is yeah. this yeah. is this is a standard uh xenon with uh i would say let's say 45 xenon 5 neon that's a pretty standard one for getting that nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, line uh, shape. That's pre pretty standard shape. That must be a oh, fun. Oh, by the way, the neon smooth. The neon makes it more sensuous. If you do just just xenon itself, it seems to be it's it's harsher. Mm. And and I, I don't like that as much. And or sometimes it'll be more lightning like and I don't like that as much. I, I like a little I like a little of the sensuality. If you hold a second. I, I'm on the phone right now. Okay, uh, where are we now? Well, the other one is those are beer. That's similar ones with the blue. Those are blue cobalt uh, beer bottles, and same same problem getting the electrodes to work on 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 those. And this one though, it's, it's hard to see, but you have others like the at the back. Some people see those as headlights. I see them in exhaust. Those are champagne uh, uh, flutes from Crate and Barrel. And so I take the bottoms off of them, the foot, and put on the top, and solder them on the top. And then put the electrode on the stem. Those, yeah. The, uh, the wheels are two nut trays that are soldered together. Oh, I, you know what's funny? I didn't even notice they were lighting up at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's they wild. have an electrode. Yeah. <laughs> this guy. So, and in this yeah. case, the you know the whole the whole body of the thing is of course grounded, and each one you can't see it here, but it's all 
uh, uh, e each one of them has one small trans uh, plasma supply, a, a one of the Tech 22s that are then uh, uh, animated, so you can get them to go at different rate, you know, on and off, etc. Okay. Were you ever a mechanic in your in your life, Ed? No. The background was in uh, architecture. Okay. A lot of mechanical figures. It just made me think it might have a love well, for cars. Not no. Actually, I I, I did have. A, I love to drive them, but you know, I I always loved my my brother always had a sports car, so I always loved driving these. <laughs> His sports cars. I, that's how I learned my how to drive on a one of those old fashioned. Uh, this one's actually based on it. The the, the those uh, classic MGs, the squared off ones. They were great. Yeah. In fact, awesome. the story with it on this one you can't see it, but it it based on that, and it has you see the bronze with a sort of the seat cushion. That's yeah. actually a Bermuda belt. And back then, we used to not have horns on the sports cars. We'd have Bermuda bells. So you'd, you'd go ding dong. So part of this is every once in a while, this thing goes ding dong. So uh, <laughs> it was referenced back to my, my old uh, days of, uh, of, of learning. But it was fun taking driver's ed in high school where I showed up in a MG sports car. So. <laughs> Fantastic. What, what, what do we call that one? Uh, this was called Blue Lightning Party Car. Yeah. See, back in the day, it was the opposite. It wasn't don't drink, don't drink and drive. It was drink and drive. Always. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why the beer bottles and the nut trays and the and the champagne flutes. <laughs> Uh, we've got about uh, three minutes left. Uh, yeah. Any any closing remarks that you want to make before we uh, close uh, out on the live stream? Uh, just to say that I, obviously I find this to be a lot of fun. It's very frustrating. Uh, it's very alchemistic. It's it's experiment. It's trial and error, and uh, you just have to see what you get and go with what you can can get, and you know. And, a lot of times you're hoping for the best, but the major thing is to have patience and also to recognize when you're going in the right direction. Mm. Because you very rarely get something right on the first shot in any of the aspects of this, whether it be the shape, whether it be the gas mixture, whether it be the electronics. It's, it's all kind of a tuning and you have a developing a sense of well, it's going the way I want. Can I go more? And, but it's also the idea that you have to be willing to take your losses and, and, and not, well, you know, if you're a glass blower, you know the same. You know, you, you can't get upset when you, drop a, when you drop a piece. I mean, half the time, the pieces you're blowing are going to break. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can't get upset. And the same, same thing with this. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, then you just go on and do if you work on it, do it again. That's that's basically it. Yeah, and you know, as frustrating as this process can be, uh, the successes are very rewarding. So, that's uh, what I have found. Yes. So thank you, Ed, for joining us tonight, and thank you, Sean, for moderating and helping us kind of navigate this whole deal. Um, thank you. Everyone out there watching the live stream, again, we have one spot left. I hope to see you guys out there um, this July. Um, keep on a lookout. We're going to try to do a lot more stuff with Taming Lightning. I can't really say to expect a lot more live stream. Uh, it's been fun trying this out uh, in this format. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll be do more in the future. Thanks, Percy. Yeah, thank you, Percy. Thank you, everyone.